heard a tiny scratching noise. It seemed to him that it was the doorknob turning. He sat up throbbing. The sound was frightened away, but began again. A faint grating, and the bottom of the door swished slowly on the carpet. The fan of pale light from the hall widened. Craning, he could see her, but only as a ghost, a white film. He held out his arms desperately, and presently she stumbled against them. No, please. Hers was the voice of a sleepwalker. I just came in to say good night and tuck you into bed. Such a bothered, unhappy child. Into bed. I'll kiss you good night and run. His head burrowed into the pillow. Her hand touched his cheek lightly. Yet through her fingers, he believed, flowed a current which lulled him into slumber. A slumber momentarily, but deep with contentment. With an effort, he said, You, too, you need comforting. Maybe you need bossing when I get over being scared of you. No, I must take my loneliness alone. I'm different, whether it's cursed or blessed, but lonely, yes, lonely. He was sharply awake as her fingers slipped up his cheek across his temple into his swart hair. Your hair is so thick, she said drowsily. Your heart beats so, dear Sharon. Suddenly clutching his arm, she cried, Come, it is the call. He was bewildered as he followed her, white in her nightgown, trimmed at the throat with white fur. Out of his room, down the hall, up a steep little stairway to her own apartments. The more bewildered to go from that genteel corridor with its forget-me-not wallpaper and stiff engravings of Virginia Worthies into a furnace of scarlet. Her bedroom was as insane as an oriental cozy corner of 1895. A couch high on carbon ivory posts, covered with a mandarin coat. Unlighted brass lamps in the likeness of mosques and pagodas. Gilt paper mache armor on the walls. A wide dressing table with a score of cosmetics in odd Parisian bottles. Tall candlesticks. The twisted and flowered candles lighted, and over everything, a hint of incense. She opened a closet, tossed a robe to him, cried, For the service of the altar, and vanished into a dressing room beyond. Diffidently, feeling rather like a fool, he put on the robe. It was of purple velvet, embroidered with black symbols unknown to him, the collar heavy with gold thread. He was not quite sure what he was to do, and he waited obediently. She stood in the doorway posing while he gaped. She was so tall and her hands at her sides, the backs up and the fingers arched, moved like lilies on the bosom of a stream. She was fantastic in a robe of deep crimson, adorned with golden stars and crescents, swastikas, and tall crosses. Her feet were in silver sandals and round her hair was a tiara of silver moons set with steel points that flickered in the candlelight. A mist of incense floated about her, seemed to rise from her, and as she slowly raised her arms, he felt in schoolboyish awe that she was veritably a priestess. Her voice was under the spell of the sleepwalker. Once more as she sighed, Come, it is the chapel. She marched to a door, part hidden by the couch, and led him into a room. Now he was no longer part amorous, part inquisitive, but all uneasy. What hanky-panky of construction had been performed he never knew. Perhaps it was merely that the floor above this small room had been removed, so that it stretched up two stories. But in any case, there it was, a shrine, bright as bedlam at the bottom, but seeming to rise through darkness to the sky. The walls were hung with black velvet. There were no chairs, and the whole room focused on a wide altar. It was an altar of grotesque humor, or madness, draped with Chinese fabrics, crimson, apricot, emerald gold. 
There were two stages of pink marble. Above the altar hung an immense crucifix with the Christ bleeding at nail wounds and pierced side. And on the upper stage were plaster busts of the Virgin, St. Teresa, St. Catherine, a garish sacred heart, a dolorous simulacrum of the dying St. Stephen. But crowded on the lower stage was a crazy rout of what Elmer called heathen idols, ape-headed gods, crocodile-headed gods, a god with three heads and a god with six arms, a jade and ivory Buddha, an alabaster naked Venus, and in the center of them all a beautiful, hideous, intimidating and alluring statuette of a silver goddess with a triple crown and a face and thin and long and passionate as that of Sharon Falconer. Before the altar was a long velvet cushion, very thick and soft. Here Sharon suddenly knelt, waving him to his knees as she cried, It is the hour, blessed virgin, Mother Hera, Mother Frigga, Mother Ishtar, Mother Isis, dread Mother Astarte of the weaving arms. It is thy priestess. It is she who, after the blind centuries and groping years, shall make it known to the world that ye are one, and that in me are ye all revealed, and that in this revelation shall come peace and wisdom universal, the secret of the spheres of the pit of understanding. Ye who have leaned over me and on my lips pressed your immortal fingers, take this, my brother, to your bosoms. Open his eyes, release his pinioned spirit, make him as the gods, that with me he may carry the revelation for which a thousand, thousand grievous years the world has panted. O rosy cross and mystic tower of ivory, hear my prayer. O sublime April crescent, hear my prayer. O sword of undaunted steel most excellent, hear thou my prayer. O serpent with unfathomable eyes, hear my prayer. Ye veiled ones and ye bright ones, from caves forgotten, the peaks of the future, the clanging today, join in me, lift up, receive him, dread nameless ones, yea, lift us then, mystery on mystery, sphere above sphere, dominion on dominion, to the very throne. She picked up a Bible which lay by her on the long velvet cushion at the foot of the altar. She crammed it into his hands and cried, Read, read quickly. It was open at the Song of Solomon, and bewildered he chanted, How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O princess daughter! The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy two breasts are like two young roes. Thy neck is as a tower of ivory, the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. How fair and how pleasant thou art, O oh, love for delights. She interrupted him, her voice high and a little shrill. O oh, mystical rose, O oh, lily most admirable, O oh, wondrous union! O oh, Saint Anna, Mother Immaculate, Demeter, Mother Beneficent, Lakshmi, Mother Most Shining, behold, I am his, and he is yours, and ye are mine. As he read on, his voice rose like a triumphant priest's. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of the boughs thereof. That verse she never finished, for she swayed sideways as she knelt before the altar and sank into his arms, her lips parted. 4. 
They sat on the hilltop, looking down on noon in the valley, sleepily talking till he roused with, Why won't you marry me? Sweet, of course I do. Oh, yes. Damn it, listen. Do you love me a little? She dropped her head on his shoulder, casually now, in the bee-thrumming orchard aisle, and his arm tightened. That evening they sang gospel hymns together to the edification of the old family servants, who began to call him doctor. 